Hey y'all, welcome to Kamira's Kitchen. Honey, today baby, today baby, I have a delicious soul food Sunday menu for you. I have some llama beans with smoked turkey, an extra cheesy five cheese mac and cheese. We're doing some homemade buttermilk biscuits and we're doing one of my favorite types of chicken, which is an extra crunchy garlic honey coated fried chicken wings. Now you guys request these sort of compilations where I give you tips. Check the description box for all my tips on how to do this meal so easily. And also check the description box for a link to my ebook where I have 25 easy but absolutely delicious soul food recipes. Let's get going. Now I am using chicken wings today. That's my favorite wings to fry and I'm seasoning them up well with adobo, green seasoning, better than bouillon, salt-free Cajun seasoning, okay? Salt-free, because the adobo is mostly the salt. Some fresh garlic, I'm using lemon juice to help tenderize the chicken because I'm actually not gonna use buttermilk for this chicken today, all right? Um, some garlic powder, all that good stuff, and I'll list that in the description box. And I'm gonna mix this up and I'm gonna let these marinate at room temperature for about 30 to 40 minutes. Now you could do this in the fridge overnight, but I ain't got that type of time today, okay? Now you will see that some liquid is gonna come off of the chicken. That is okay. You actually want that liquid because I'm gonna use a different method than maybe some of you guys are used to. I'm gonna actually be adding some self-rising flour to the chicken as well as some tapioca starch, but potato starch can work and corn starch can work. The starch is gonna help the chicken get crunchy. This is a very crunchy chicken, okay? So if you don't like the super crunchiness, this may not be the recipe for you or I'll give you some tips to help modify this, okay? Now, when you mix this up, you are going to see that all that extra liquid has absorbed. And one of the benefits of doing this method is that you actually don't lose any of the seasoning because you know sometimes when you dip in buttermilk and an egg, some of the seasoning will come off. It's not possible with this method. Now, this is the second coating. I'm going to be adding some more tapioca starch and some more self-rising flour. Now you might be wondering why I'm using self-rising flour. It's because it has baking powder. That baking powder actually helps your chicken crust get even crunchier. If you don't have self-rising flour, just add like a teaspoon of baking powder to this flour mixture, okay? I'm pretty much gonna use the same dry seasonings again. I'm going light with them, okay? But I, I do want that flour to have some seasoning, baby, okay? I ain't trying to have no bland chicken. And then I am going to mix this up well. Now, my favorite method for coating chicken is to get some good old tough aware, put the flour and the seasoning in it, and then you actually just start dunking your chicken into the flour mixture. You can also do this by getting like a um, brown paper bag, like a brown grocery bag. It's pretty much the same thing, okay? But I ain't always got that. All right, then I am going to mix this up really well. I'm going to give it a good shake, you know, get a little arm worked out, okay? And then I'm going to take out the chicken and I'm going to dust off all of the excess flour. Any excess flour will just fall off into the grease. So you need to shake it off. I'm then going to let the chicken sit for about 10 to 15 minutes. Now, if you don't like a super crunchy crust, what you can do is skip this second coating. You can do the first coating where you mix it up with the water and then you can just go to frying. Okay, try it both ways and see which one you like best. Now in my Dutch oven, I have some vegetable oil heating. It's heated up to about 370, 380, okay, which is fine because it's gonna go down when I add the chicken. The temperature is gonna drop. But if you don't have a thermometer, just stick a chopstick in it. You'll see it bubble, like bubbles form around it and you know your oil is going to be hot enough. My chicken wings took about 10 minutes to cook. I flipped them, you know, once or twice, but y'all can see my chicken wings are big. Like this was a bird, do you hear me? Okay, this chicken, I don't know what this chicken was doing, but it was downright big, okay? Now, if you got some drumsticks, you can go for about 13 to 14 minutes. Same with thighs. Thighs take about seven minutes on each side. You know, you'll flip it halfway through. I don't really cook chicken breast that often, so I'm not really familiar with the times for fried chicken breast, but when yours looks kind of golden like this you set it to the side on a wire rack so that all the oil can drain off all right now this coating 
Now, this sauce is the boss, baby. I have some butter, I have some garlic, and I have some honey. I mix this together with just a pinch of cayenne, but you could also add in some hot sauce. Ooh, you add some hot sauce, you couldn't cook it. Now, I was just trying to be cute, so I went in with a little parsley, and I just cooked this on medium heat for about three to four minutes until everything was melted and everything had come together. For me, the easiest thing to do when you want to coat the chicken is to simply put it in a bowl and then toss it in the sauce and that will thoroughly coat it. Don't do this until you're ready to serve this. Since you are making this a part of a bigger meal, what you can do is actually cut your oven on 200 degrees and while you're frying and while you're getting other things prepared, you can just have your fried chicken sitting in the oven on a rack at 200, keeping it warm and then right before you serve, you can go ahead and just toss you know toss it in the sauce don't do it initially because you don't want it to get soggy at all you better get your mama your auntie and your grandma out the kitchen when you're making this one because this mac and cheese is so good mm -mm, you gonna reach back and slap somebody I am using sharp cheddar, mozzarella, and parmesan cheese, as well as cream cheese for extra creaminess, and some Munster and Kobe Jack deli slices. I just use these cheeses because this is what I had on hand, but you use anything you want, baby, okay? Some unsalted butter, of course, some Elmo macaroni, as well as some spices. Now, I know a lot of people just like salt and pebbles, but I like garlic powder, Tony's, and Lowry's as well some heavy cream and some half and half. I'm gonna make some chicken broth just by putting a little bit of better than bouillon in the pasta water. And then of course, I'm gonna cook the macaroni according to the package instructions. Now, once I drain this, I'm gonna put the noodles right back in the pot, okay? Cause I don't want all these dirty dishes, all right? So we are gonna minimize the mess and just do everything in the pot. Plus the pie is already warm. So it's going to help everything melt, which is what you want, okay? So first I'm putting in the cream cheese. Now you can also substitute sour cream with cream cheese and I actually do that quite often, but I had cream cheese today, so that's what I wanted to use. I'm letting that melt in the heat of the noodles and then I'm gonna begin seasoning. Now you really can just do the seasonings to your taste, okay? Since you haven't put in any egg or anything like that, you can just actually taste your noodles and see how good it is. I know a lot of people just like salt, pepper, and if that's you, go ahead and do it, all right? Go ahead and do it. But I like flavor in mine, and trust me, if you put in the Tony's and a little bit of that Lowry's and just a pinch of garlic powder, I promise you, people will be wondering, mm, what's that thing up in that mac that you doing, okay? And you ain't gotta have to tell them. You can keep it your secret, baby, okay? Now, your butter is also going to need to melt into the heat of the noodles before you put in any of the other liquid ingredients. Now, if you're enjoying this recipe so far, go ahead and give your girl a thumbs up and subscribe for weekly videos because honey, okay, it's flavor everywhere on this channel and go ahead and get you some, all right? Now, I'm gonna start by putting in first the shredded cheeses and these were pre-shredded. Typically, I don't use this because they, it does have that coating on them that prevents them from melting as well as, say, if you had just shredded from the block of cheese. But I won't try to do all that today, okay? So I'm going to actually do a couple of, you know, a couple of techniques to make sure that the cheese still comes out creamy, even though I'm using the pre-shredded cheese that has this little coating. Okay, so go ahead and mix that in and allow that to start melting. And then I'm gonna put in some of the Lowry's or you could just use regular salt at this point. Of course, I'm gonna mix all my seasonings in and guys, give your stuff a taste, okay? Just taste it yourself a little bit. Now, heavy cream is going to make this super rich. I love putting heavy cream in mac and cheese because it is has so much fat in it, but you could also substitute evaporated milk. I do that often, and I'm also going to put it half and half, which of course is whole milk and some additional heavy cream. Now, right now, you might notice that all of the little cheese bits are not fully melted. Don't worry about that, okay? Don't worry about that, all right? It's going to still come together. 
Now I am gonna throw in one egg. So at this point, I'm no longer gonna taste for seasoning. I like putting in this one egg. I feel like it helps to bind it. If you are anti-egg, okay, if you are anti-egg, don't come for me, because this is the way my mama did it, and that's the way I'm gonna do it. All right, and that's all I got to say about it, okay? I'm gonna mix that up, and then I'm going to start layering everything. And this is where, okay, this is where you gonna get the, I'm gonna tell y'all the extra cheesy secrets, okay? This is where I'm gonna give y'all the down low. All right, now of course I'm gonna butter my baking pan, and then I'm going to put in half of my mixture, okay? Once I put in this half of the mixture, I'm then going to go in and begin to put on a layer of the deli slices. Since the deli slices are not coated with any sort of cornstarch or potato starch or anything like that to keep them from separating, this is basically just like if you had got the cheese off of the block. So by putting this in as your middle layer, it's going to create a very nice cheese pool because you're gonna have literally a solid layer of cheese. And on top of that, you did not have to do any shredding. So look, this is a quick time saver, especially this holiday season when we aren't trying to, you know, we're trying to do some shortcuts, get you some deli slices and that will work. I put on just a little bit of the Parmesan cheese in the middle and then I sprinkled on just some additional seasonings on top of that layer. I'm then gonna go in and I'm going to put on some more of the deli slices, okay? This is a thick layer of cheese, baby. This is a thick layer of cheese, trust me. Do this, okay? Follow these instructions and your macaroni and cheese is going to come out perfect. It may be super cheesy in the middle, but it's going to be good. I'm then gonna put on the rest of the mac and cheese and I'm actually going to layer the top with the remaining deli slices and use a little bit more of that Parmesan. Now guys, do me a favor and in the comments, let me know what types of recipes you would like to see during this holiday and festive season. We all know that this is the time for food, cozy, warming food, it's just things that will stick to your bones. So just let me know what you guys would like to see me make in the next couple of months and weeks. Now, as you see here, I'm putting on my last layer of the deli slices. And trust me, there it's going to melt and form a beautiful crust on the top of this mac and cheese. And then I'm gonna put on just the last bit of that Parmesan that I have left. I'm gonna sprinkle on, of course, a little bit of paprika for some color, and I'm gonna bake this in a 375 degree oven for about 30 minutes. If you see the top getting too brown, of course, you can cover it with foil and continue to bake it. If you have a larger pan of mac and cheese, then I would extend the cooking time by about 10 minutes until it is done. Now, I know some of you guys have been on paper plate duty, okay, bringing sodas to the cookout because don't nobody want your food. But let me tell you, if you start making your mac and cheese like this, baby, you gonna get up into the kitchen with the OGs, with the mamas and the aunties, the ones that wear kitty heels, right, and sing church hymns, amen, because this food right here is delicious. Everybody likes a good, super cheesy mac and cheese paired up with some fried chicken. And to go along with this, we're gonna do some llama beans with some smoked turkey. You can also do my collard greens with smoked turkey if you don't like llama beans. And I'm gonna link that recipe in the description box for you. So this is super easy. Now, first off, I have a one pound turkey wing and I am going to add that to my Instant Pot with three cups of water and a teaspoon and a half of better than bouillon. I'm gonna pressure cook this for 30 minutes to give it a jump start on the llama beans so that it'll be tender. Now, if you don't have an Instant Pot, first off, what you doing, baby, okay? Y'all already know these modern appliances make cooking easier and it makes it faster. But if you don't have one and you don't wanna get one, go ahead and pop this on the stove with about four cups of water for about 45 minutes to an hour and just let it simmer away, okay? You're gonna see your turkey is gonna be soft, but it's not gonna be fall off the bone as of yet. 
Now in a pot, I'm going to add a tablespoon and a half of butter. I'm going to allow this to melt and I'm going in with that holy trinity. Hallelujah. Thank Jesus. Some celery, some bell pepper and some onions. Now I'm going to let this saute in total for about three to four minutes. And I'm going to add a little bit of Tony's just to help this saute along. Now, my bell pepper was actually slightly spicy um, because it's a type that I grow that has a little bit of heat. If you want to mimic the flavor, then you can put in about half of a red bell pepper and about half of a jalapeno. I know llama beans aren't typically spicy, but I promise you that little kick actually is nice. I'm then going to go in with about a teaspoon of fresh minced garlic, some bay leaves, and some parsley. And you might be thinking, my grandma didn't put all that, her llama beans. And you're probably right, but this is Camille's kitchen, and I'm showing y'all how I do it. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to let that saute for 30 seconds, and then I'm going to put in about a fourth of a teaspoon of some white pepper. And that's pretty much all the seasonings that you're going to need for this. I'm going to let that saute for about 30 more seconds, and then I'm going in with that smoked turkey. Now, y'all, I've been nibbling on that smoked turkey. I ain't going to lie. That smoked turkey was good. And then I'm going to add in the broth. I'm going to put on my cover. I'm going to let this come to a boil. Now, my favorite llama beans to use is the frozen kind. I don't usually mess with the dried llama beans too much. And I'm going to end up putting in one pound. You could actually add in the whole 24 ounce bag, but I just didn't need that much, that many llama beans. If you do the whole 24 ounce bag, then you're most likely going to need to add about half of a cup to three fourths of a cup more water to this just to balance everything out. Now on the instructions, you will see that it says to simmer for about 20 to 25 minutes I find that when you do that though the lima beans are thawed they're not soft enough for me so I like to saute my lima beans for about 45 minutes what I don't like to do is to have my lima beans super soft and just mushy and almost soupy that's really the way I was raised having them and I don't prefer that at all I like my lima beans to still be intact Okay, I don't want them just mushy all over the place. If you know what I'm talking about, let, let me know in the comments. Okay, I know y'all done been to more than one church potluck with some mushy llama beans. All right. Now, I'm going to go in, and at this point, it's been 45 minutes. My lima beans are tender. Everything tastes great. And I'm going to pick off the meat on the smoked turkey, and I'm going to end up taking out the bone. Now, the broth has concentrated, so that's why I said don't add too many seasonings in the beginning because the broth level is going to go down, and the flavor is going to come together. I have had my heat on a low simmer this whole entire time. So this is not a high heat affair. Pick out them bay leaves. And then if you need to adjust the seasonings, you can do it now. But mine didn't need nothing. There's nothing like some good old llama beans, but guys, you're really going to take the cake. You know, you're going to be chef for the day when you give your family some homemade buttermilk biscuits. One of the keys to biscuits is using the right flour. I like to use Southern Biscuit because that's the most readily available flour near me. It has a really soft crumb. It already has the baking powder and salt and everything in it in the right proportion. Um, you could also use White Lily, but this is the most available where I am. So I am going to use a scale to measure out two cups of this flour. Now, a lot of people add too much flour to their baking recipes so their stuff ends up dry. Two cups of self-rising flour is 250 grams. Now, if you don't have a scale, then you're going to need to sift your flour and then you're going to need to spoon it into your measuring cup and then level it off with the back of a spoon. And that's one cup. And you need to do that twice. I think using the scale is actually quicker. Now, since I'm going to use my counter to roll out my biscuits, I want to go ahead and clean my counter. I have a mixture of water and a little bit of that sow suds. Remember, I've been showing you guys that. I'll link that in the description. I use that as an all-purpose cleaner. And then I take a cloth with just water and I take a zigzag motion down my counter so I don't miss anything and then there's no soap residue that can get inside of my biscuits. You wanna do this before you start blending because once you start blending, baby, look, you, you don't need to be wasting no time. So I'm gonna add my flour to a food processor. To me, this is the quickest and easiest thing to do. I'm gonna add a teaspoon of sugar and then I'm just gonna pulse this a little bit so, you know, let everything fluff up, you know what I'm saying? Get it light and fluffy, okay? 
Now, of course, you don't need a food processor to make biscuits, but that's the point of modern day appliances. They make your life easy, okay? And it makes it so that you don't have to handle the dough as much. Now, I've had one stick of unsalted butter cut up into half inch cubes and I've put it in my freezer. I left the wax paper at the bottom so that I could easily get out the butter. And I'm just pulsing this into the flour very gently. And then I'll let it go for about three seconds and then I'll open it and see where I'm at. I am looking for my flour and butter to sort of be lightly cut into each other. You should see pellets of butter. Okay, this butter was frozen. So you'll see about pea sized or like half pea sized pellets of butter. And that's okay. That's what you want because it's going to further blend a little bit with this buttermilk. I'm putting in three fourths a cup of cold buttermilk. And then I'm going to blend this together. I'm going to pulse it. And then I'm just going to blend it together for about three to four seconds. And then I'm going to go ahead and take the lid off. Now you will see that the dough is sticky. Okay. It won't be fully together. And that is actually okay. You don't need it to be fully lumped together because when you put it on the counter, that is what's going to happen. You should see that the dough has some individual butter chunks inside of it. That is what you want. I'm now going to take out my dough and I'm going to put out some flour onto the counter and I'm going to take the dough out and I'm going to gently form it into like a circle, like a ball. At this point, you want to handle the dough as little as possible, okay? You ain't kneading and, and doing all this extra stuff to biscuits, okay? There's no yeast in this. You don't want a bunch of excess gluten to form. That is how a lot of people get tough biscuits. I'm going to put some flour on the outside of my hands and I'm going to very softly and quickly press this into sort of a somewhat flat rectangle-ish shape. I'm going to make sure there's flour on the top that will help it form like a little bit of a layer in the biscuit and then I'm going to gently fold it over and I'm going to press it down again. I'm going to go in with a little more flour. It doesn't have to be a ton of excess but you do want a little on the top. Gently press it down and then I'll fold it over again. I'll repeat this three times. Now, if you have a different method of making biscuits or just a way that you do it, let me know in the comments. I would not say that I'm a biscuit master master <laughs> by any means. I know I'm from the South, y'all. You know, I know I'm a Southern bear, but the truth is, is that, you know, it took me a while to get my biscuits to come out to where I thought they tasted good. And I'm always looking for more tips on how to get better and better biscuits. Now, I will say one thing I don't tend to do is I don't tend to cut out the circular biscuits unless I'm trying to impress somebody which I'm barely trying to impress somebody y'all I will just use a knife to cut out the squares because it's easier and I've never had anybody complain now I'm going to flour my rolling pin and then I'm going to very quickly and gently roll this into about one inch thickness you know the dough about one inch thickness then you're going to see me go in and just kind of shape up the edges since I'm not going to cut out circles I do want the edges to look at least somewhat presentable one reason why I do like cutting out these squares is because you don't have to go in and re-roll because those next biscuits that you re-roll will always be a lot flatter and sometimes a little bit denser now there is a trick to getting the squares you're going to need a sharp knife and you're going to cover the edge of it with flour you are just going to go down and you are just going to press down and you are going to come up you are not going to drag your knife across the dough that is going to prevent your biscuits from rising at the end i'm going to try to as little as possible overlap since my knife isn't long enough there's always a little part at the end i'm just going to try to line it up press down and come up I'm not going to try to overlap with the line I've already done because I want the biscuits to rise really well. Now you're going to see that I have nine easy biscuits. On my baking sheet, I've lined this with parchment paper. I'm going to try to touch the biscuits together. This will help keep the biscuits soft. It will also help them get a little bit of a rise. I've had my oven preheating at 450 degrees. Cooking biscuits is a high heat affair, baby. Okay, this ain't no low heat affair. Okay, I'm going to cook these biscuits for 10 to 12 minutes until the tops are nice and golden. I actually like mine to be a little bit brown. 
If you like yours to be a little bit lighter, then you just do yours closer to the 10 minute side. Now, of course, biscuits are not biscuits without some delicious butter on top. I like to take some nice melted butter, just about a tablespoon, and I just go ahead and brush it on right when I take these biscuits out of the oven. One of my tips for making buttermilk biscuits as a part of a fuller soul food meal is when you take them out the oven, you can go ahead and put them in on a plate or in a basket and you should cover them up with a tea towel or a clean kitchen towel. That's gonna help keep them warm while everything else is cooking. Of course, if they do cool, you can just pop them in the air fryer in the oven just on 200, just for a few minutes to give them a little warmth and they're still going to taste great as a part of a meal like this. Now, if you do eat them for breakfast, let me know what you also eat them with when you have your breakfast foods. Now, I do hope you guys did enjoy these recipes. Remember to check the description box for the details and let me know if you make this meal for one of your soul food Sundays. Don't forget that I love you and Jesus loves you. He is the savior of the world. God bless everyone that watches my channel. You guys are such a blessing to me. And I know I'm going to see you next time in Kamira's Kitchen. Goodbye. God bless.